Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julio Navio. I have the pleasure of, of chair this session about Internet of Things, the future of Internet of Things. We are very lucky because in, in this panel we have representation of hardware companies, software companies, university and municipalities. So we have real experts in what is going to happen uh, in the coming years in Internet of Things. Uh, before uh, giving the word to our experts and present them, I just want to take a couple of minutes to present the Association of Telecommunication Engineering in Spain. One of the key uh, success factors for the uh, growth of uh, the city, smart cities in Spain is that all the actors in Spain are working together to build the smart cities. Not only companies, not only municipalities and public administration, also the civil uh, society is working very hard in, in building these smart cities and also the professionals. We are an organization of 10,000 professional uh, telecommunication engineer, master science of tel in telecommunication engineer, and most of them are working in technological issues like smart cities. In fact, our college, our association, is working in three areas of smart cities that I want to just give you in a nutshell what is, is our role on that. Uh, first of all, we work in building the environment and creating opportunities for the professional. In that sense, we are, we are supporting the Spanish network of smart cities and supporting them technically in terms of uh, giving technical advice and technological support. Also, the, the different municipalities and the, and the uh, central government, the State Secretary of Telecommunication is supported by us in this, uh, in this area. And also trying to build opportunities of, of job work for the, for the professionals, for the engineers and the experts in, in ICTs. Secondly, we are deeply involved in the standardization um, creating uh, the, the norms and, and the standards for, for the uh, development of smart cities. Spain is working very hard in building norms that, that we want to, to also present internationally because uh, if we, we don't work together and we make uh, open standard and uh, uh, open platform, we are not going to be successful in uh, smart cities. So a deep involvement in the standardization process in Spain. And uh, third, we, we work with the universities and researchers in terms of uh, identifying the, the, the important and relevant issues in uh, smart cities. Last year we present here in this Congress a uh, joint research with the Autonoma uh, University in Madrid about some comparison of different uh, success cases of uh, smart cities and currently we are preparing a research with the Spanish network of uh, smart cities just to identify the benefits of building networks of cities for the successful of the development of the smart cities. So as you see we are uh, a relevant actor in, in the smart cities arena in Spain and because of that the, uh, the organization invited me to chair this, this in interesting panel. I don't want to take more time from the time of the speakers and we are going to start with the presentation of uh, Mr. Jamie Cullen from the D Dublin City Council. While Jamie is preparing the presentation, I want to say that he manages and coordinates all the smart cities program in Dublin, and it's very interesting that how they build out, demonstrate, or pilot a solution across industry, the, the municipality, the academia, the universities, and also how they involve the citizenship. That's Jamie. Great. That's great, thanks. It's uh, fantastic to be here in Barcelona, such a, an, an interesting event. Um, it's, it's quite amazing to see all the innovations happening out in the expo and trying to figure out how as a city we can start implementing them at scale. Um, I manage our smart city program in Dublin City Council working with our chief executive and uh, Dublin for those of you who don't know is in Ireland. It's a relatively small city about 1.6 million and within Dublin City Council the area that 
uh, I'm involved in, it's about a population of about half a million. But just a few facts and figures on Dublin. And we were very fortunate as a city that we have nine of ten of the top tech companies in the world located here. All the big uh, players, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Intel, PayPal, the list goes on and on. We've got great research centers, uh, the whole emergence of a startup culture, um, a real thriving startup scene as we're seeing in a lot of international cities. Great civic tech projects like Code for Ireland, uh, great research centers, uh, an openness for experimentation and innovation. Uh, and you're one of the friendliest cities in the world. Um, I don't know if you've been to Dublin, but it's a, it's a great city. So we've got great um, assets to build out uh, a smart city. And really, over the last year, uh, we've set up this uh, proper top uh, level coordination role within the city to pull together our smart city program and put some shape to it. And uh, we're, we're, we're going to talk about some of the learnings here uh, today. Just some of the big initiatives that we've had over the last couple of years, open data. I mean, open data, data fuels the smart city. And I love this graphic, you know, as you connect your, your, your different data and systems, it, it fuels and drives innovation in your cities. So we've got a very well established open data portal. We've got a dashboard like most progressive cities in this space, you know, how you push that data out, uh, communicate what's happening in your, in your city to citizens. Uh, and it's a, it's a great resource. Just in the last couple of weeks, we've launched our Smart Dublin initiative where we've started working across the region with the four Dublin local authorities. And really, it's about you know, telling the story in terms of why we're trying to be smart, engaging with citizens, and then showcasing best practice. I don't know uh, in the case of your own city, but cities are pretty bad in telling their stories and showcasing what they do well, and we want to put Dublin on the map. Our mantra in terms of Smart Dublin is, you know, it's a connected, a connected city where technology improves services and quality of life for the citizen. citizen. It's open, open collaboration, open innovation, open data. And it's all about co-creation, uh, how we can engage business, research, and citizens to meet people's needs and to build out smart solutions. Type of challenges that we're looking at in Dublin, um, and this is kind of based on the type of areas that we have responsibility for in the city, mobility, extreme weather events, environmental, uh, and energy efficiency, and these are probably similar across most cities, but we've worked across uh, over 100 operational staff across the region to figure out what our priorities are, to get that bottom-up approach in terms of um, developing uh, solutions and projects. And these are driven by you know, the, the challenge of climate change, sustainability, and the importance of how we can better engage with citizens. So today I'm going to talk about just uh, building the next generation of IoT, and I think you know, what we've seen the last couple of days, and I loved uh, Dan Doktorov's presentation from Google Sidewalks yesterday, um, we're entering an age of technology innovation like no other. Connected everything is starting to take shape and cities are going to be at the center of this. And you just look at the, the, you know, the, the, the proliferation of uh, you know, processor power um, uh, over the past year, number of years and the opportunity that creates in terms of um, low cost high processing power, um, low energy usage is, is going to be amazing for cities. So really this opportunity of connected everything. Um, you know, you see 50 billion devices projected uh, by Cisco for 2020, but we're going to have a hell of a lot of connected things. Um, according to Business Insider, we're going to see about 5 billion more devices in cities in the next couple of years with a projected economic value of 420 billion for cities. But equally, on the other side, if cities don't do this well, um, you know, it, it could be quite detrimental if they get locked into the wrong technology, the wrong type of systems. But as we connect up our cities, our buildings, our people, our vehicles, you know, and the data that generates is going to are going to create huge opportunities for better optimization and management of our city. I love this chart by Gartner, uh, the hype curve. You could put IoT at the at the peak at the moment. You know, promises a lot, but like, when are we going to see the? the large-scale deployment. Um, and I guess when you walk around the expo, you see some amazing technologies and innovations. But really, we need better validation of the technology. We need to look at the, the emerging business models. And you know, we, as a city, we're trying to support that to better understand it ourselves. I think most cities in this space are trying to understand it themselves before they can go out and scale up uh, the solutions. And we can move IoT, urban IoT, to the high growth phase. So like most cities, we've got quite extensive amounts of IoT deployments, a lot of point solutions uh, within different silos. Um, intelligent transport is really leading the way um, in most cities, but progress has been slow in terms of how we can scale that up and how we can connect all these different uh, solutions across our cities. So everything from smart bins to flood monitoring uh, to looking at how we can better deploy low-cost sensors. Um, so quite exciting times for cities, but quite challenging as well. So I'm just going to show you a quick video that captures uh, an IoT demonstrator project that we're building out uh, with Intel. And I think it looks, it looks at the end-to-end -end 
piece and, and I'll follow up on some of the issues after the video. In the last two years we have had seven of the 20 highest high tides uh, since records began. We're a pretty flood resilient city but there, there are increasing incidents of flooding and uh, the key to us is uh, to find ways of responding to those, trying to predict them better and respond better so with limited resources we can, we can, we can have a better response. Our brief is to reduce the existing flooding and look at the, the future flooding and uh, put uh, defences and uh, mitigating measures uh, in place. There's a general expectation that we will, uh, one, that we will prevent as far as possible, that we will give people better information as to when they can expect flooding and that we will have, uh, you know, a, 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 as good a response when there are actual flooding incidents. So, and that really requires us to have uh, much better information, particularly when it comes to deploying our limited resources. My name is Ima Rodoli and and I live in between the Talca River and the canal in the north inner city. Five years ago-ish, we had a big flood in the area. It seemed that the river had overflowed and in the middle of the night we could hear water running and I thought that the, the water tank was burst or something and we went into the kitchen and there was eight, ten inches of water in the whole kitchen. It was completely flooded. Dublin City Council are working with Intel on a research project on the future of flood management. It was an agreement between ourselves, uh, Intel and Dublin City Council to explore uh, the new gateways that we've developed. The first aim of the research is to provide good information to the council that they can use um, for their, you know, to make decisions around flood management. Intel designs gateways which are literally small compute platforms that sit at the edge of networks. It allows us to integrate sensors. So for example, working with Dublin, we build environmental sensors and they connect to these gateways. And these gateways are positioned on lampposts, for example. They can be positioned on traffic lights. So it gives us the ability to very quickly capture data, bring that data together, and send that information to the cloud for processing. From the city's perspective, we're capturing various different types of environmental data sources and then we're providing that information to the, the city through a portal where they can build on it and so that's what the Internet of Things is all about, the ability to actually react and make a decision. My name is Roy O'Donnell, I'm the Gully Manager for Dublin City Council. If we had the benefit of hyperlocal data through census throughout the city we could certainly use it in an instant to know where we can send and deploy our resources to we know where the rainfall is hitting at its hardest and at its heaviest, and it's accurate. Then we can deploy our resources to those areas, or more of our resources to those areas. All the challenges that we face, you know, there's an overriding challenge in terms of we operate in a very constrained resource environment. So it, no matter what we're trying to do, we're trying to do it now uh, smarter ways and, and with less resources. And the traditional model of just deploying any number of people to deal with problems, that's no longer sustainable. So in an era like flood management, uh, we need to just be a lot smarter so we can get a better return from our more limited resources. I see technology playing a very critical role in terms of the future of, of all uh, major cities, and Dublin in particular. And if we can work with companies like Intel, it, it gives us an opportunity to sort of to be at the, at the forefront of, of technological innovation, something the City Council could never do on its own. I think that's a, a great example of you know, what IoT offers uh, to cities. And be it Intel or any company that we're working at, that, that's, we're, we're up against a very challenging context in terms of IoT involves so many different stakeholders and solution providers. So you've got the, the different sensors. So you see the chart here on the left. You've got all these different sensors that we already have. How do you connect them in? How do you deploy low cost sensors? How do you validate that they actually work and they, they make sense? How do you connect and communicate that uh, to the cloud? How do you power these devices? And then when the data you know, is pushed up to the cloud, how do you integrate it? How do you fuse it? How do you analyze it? What about the data security, the privacy, the interoperability, the APIs? Uh, and then how do we use that data to actually make decisions? Uh, because ultimately, if we don't have action based on that data, it's, 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 it's no good. Um, so really, some of the things that we looked at uh, and we've learned from our pilots and you know, our experience in IoT is that, you know, there's this huge expectation on cities to deliver better services with less resources. I don't know how that works, but, you know, there's an opportunity with technology to help, help us to do that, but we're, we're under pressure in terms of resources and staff cuts. 
But what we found in terms of our experiences in Dublin, if you engage with the operational staff, the people like the Roy's and, uh, and, and the people you saw on the video there, they're the people that will act as champions and actually help you deliver uh, these initiatives within your city. Without those champions, you're going to have a, a, a real struggle. Um, it's great to experiment with this low-cost sensing opportunity, but it's not without its challenges. But the data that it produces, you know, how do you turn that into intelligence? How do you uh, create better city systems that help you predict, adapt, and respond, and ultimately help the citizens make better decisions? I mean, these systems are no good unless you can respond. And then what about connected infrastructure? How do you get access to power? Uh, how do you enable this? I mean, some of the big problems in terms of our IoT deployments is access to power, and you know, sorting that out can be quite challenging. You know, connectivity, you start thinking about what's your connectivity plan for your city? You know, where does uh, the, the licensed and unlicensed spectrum fit in this? Are you ready for this uh, revolution in terms of urban IoT and connected devices? Are you going to be able to cope with it? Will your city have the infrastructure to enable it to happen uh, at an effective cost level? Um, and then there's new business models and ways of working uh, and breaking out of the silos and making the business case at a higher level that can benefit multiple stakeholders. And, you know, then how do you finance this? I mean, that's a big challenge. You know, are there revenue sharing models? Um, how do you leverage your, your infrastructure and your assets in, in new ways? Well, really what we found in Dublin, I think most cities, you know, we don't have the answers within the city council. We don't have the expertise. So unless we have this model of engagement and collaboration, uh, we're not going to succeed. So we need to work with industry. We need to work with entrepreneurs, with SMEs, with uh, researchers, and with citizens uh, to co-innovate and partner to build out the future uh, of IoT. And in Dublin, we're quite lucky that we've got a great ecosystem to do that. But then the big challenge, just to end with, yeah, two minutes, I'll be finished in 30 seconds, uh, is how do we actually procure these solutions? How do we find the best solutions? Because procurement is just a terrible process. You know, we tend to specify, you know, what we think the solution is, uh, and do it in an incorrect way that we actually end up buying into the wrong products and services. So how do we engage with innovative SMEs, entrepreneurs, um, and how can we um, tap into the opportunity that technology and disruption uh, is, is offers in terms of cities? So we're working with organizations like CityMart to you know, take a challenge-based approach, and in 2016, we'll be rolling out challenges to our Smart Dublin platform, so watch out. And if you're interested in getting involved and working in Dublin, we're open for business. And uh, we're hoping that we can work uh, with the best people, with the best ideas uh, to solve the big challenges that our city faces. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation for all the panel. Let, let, now, let's welcome Jung John Lee. That is next speaker. He is professor of technological management in Yonsei University in Korea, and he was the leading research chef in smart city to formulate the national strategy of smart city for the, the, the whole country of Korea. Currently, he is involved in Busan IoT smart city, testbed, and living labs. Thank you. Hi, uh, hola, <laughs> actually. Uh, everybody was saying hola uh, when I come here. So I've, I'm very happy that uh, I'm back in, in 2013 here. I mean, since 13, 2013. I just wanted to, actually, I prepared quite a lot of slides, but uh, I wanted to be brief as possible. Uh, you know, what I'm going to share with you today is the what currently, uh, what we are doing in Korea right now in, in, in the city of Busan. Uh, just giving you this uh, aspects that actually I've been analyzing the smart city maturity for last uh, uh, five years or, or six years and uh, actually this year that we actually did uh, six cities with uh, uh, comparing the 560 smart services with the 65 smart city living program living lab programs uh, with uh, uh, including the Barcelona and New York and London and every city so I'm going to share a little bit about that and then going into the uh, introducing the Busan as well uh, just giving you this, open data is the source of obviously the smart city innovation as well. And you can see that how the city has been growing up with their uh, uh, number of the API. Also, they have been using the API and also the different kind of category of uh, 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 the API here. The New York is actually doing quite well with this, uh, uh, having a variety of the open data movement as well. This actually leads to the service diversity. So more different kind of services are evolving with the different cities. And city has got a more category with more different kind of uh, 
uh, services innovations are happening here as well. But in terms of integration, so we see a lot of our services uh, in different cities has a uh, rather smaller kind of integrations uh, with the, under the one platform as well. So as you can see in the outside, when you talk to Cisco and when you talk to that, they are all talking about the platform. And that means lead to the kind of a, a massive service integration is maybe required as well in the next few years' time. Uh, typical example of the Seoul Topis is the one of example that actually you put a lot of different source of information, open API information into the one services and using as a one single services in the one platform as well. In terms of intelligence, uh, we also measure this as a urban proactiveness and uh, in here that the cities actually use the most of this uh, uh, AMI or, or, or kind of sensors to using these things and Amsterdam was actually uh, using quite well on these infrastructure, infrastructures and uh, uh, several cities are doing these things together as well. And, but if IoT is coming in, I think the more and more cities are going to use in these kind of services and infrastructures in for the next few years as well. Obviously, this way can be complemented and increase the, in order to increase the network effects uh, based on this kind of infrastructures. Uh, obviously, the Living Lab program or some kind of smart city initiatives have to be uh, you know, growing at the same time. And this is showing that the, how, if you see the type D, which is the, actually the, we are looking at the physical innovation zone to uh, see how uh, the, the smart city will be evolved, that there are more and more city going to use the, this kind of living labs or innovation zones to actually try out the new kind of services or IoT services as well. Busan is actually second largest city in Korea. And uh, uh, we have a uh, very famous for the logistic transportation and uh, uh, tourism as well. And uh, locate in the city is located in the south part of the Korea. Uh, and also uh, the Korean government actually put the f uh, fund on the uh, uh, 12 million US dollar to actually sponsor by the uh, Minister of Science. Uh, the project is about 32 months. We are specifically talking about the IoT implementation in smart city. And also, the, we are the coordinator is done by the SK Telecom, which is the largest mobile carrier in Korea as well. Uh, we are working with, closely with the Busan metropolitan city too, looking at a specific area called Heunde, which is the, very similar to Cannes Beach, or they do the film festival all the way annually as well. It's very popular tourism places. Uh, our vision is that we wanted to have a global reference smart city. We wanted to have a sustainable, and also we have to have a knowledge creations in terms of the IoT as well. Uh, in order to do that, we wanted to actually create a kind of, you know, 500 IoT professional and a lot of uh, founding companies to do these things. And uh, three aspects that we're actually tackling here as well. Uh, these are the, actually the partners that we are doing. Currently about 20 companies are there. Where we created an ecosystem at the starting point, but we're going to expand more and more. Obviously, there will be the international partners here to work together uh, to actually implement this kind of IoT smart city together as well. Our strategy is very clear though. One is actually we want to establish the uh, standard one to one M2M uh, platform uh, because the smart city platform is now have to be using the open data. Uh, obviously, the, a lot of people have to be engaged with the different stakeholders basically. So the platform is the very important here. Obviously, again, the, we emphasize the citizen participatory services uh, is very important. Also, the utilizing the smart sensing based infrastructures and also uh, the fourth one, fifth one, is talking about the globalization, also the revitalizing the economy within the Busan city as well. So based on this strategy, we actually formulated the 10 different kind of action plan. And currently, we are half uh, going through uh, services. And we actually try to implement 10 services, which are going to be open in next uh, months. Uh, already, some services are already displayed in the, our expo here as well. Uh, we are using the one M2M platform to uh, resolving the problem of interoperability and also the try to be connectivity together uh, to looking at these things together and obviously the exist system have to be connected together as well. So this kind of uh, connectivity and uh, uh, ground of this kind of uh, interconnectivity together with the interoperability will be the uh, our main kind of uh, uh, development here in the uh, smart city platform. Obviously, we are expanding for next three years to uh, exploring more open API extensions, and there will be obviously there are going to be a complement programs to actually engaging this kind of platform to develop the new apps and new services and new 
kind of infrastructures to utilize the uh, uh, smart city here in Busan. Uh, stage three is actually the commercializations that we wanted to find a killer business application for IoT. And also we wanted to mash up with a lot of uh, data and open API as well. Uh, one thing we wanted to do along with its uh, service development is actually we wanted to create a smart city community. Uh, basically, these people will be involving in a lot of uh, different kind of activity here as well. Uh, there are some services here. We're using the smart parking and also the crosswalk is the kind of IoT using the sensors. That if there is a disabled people trying to cross the road, uh, obviously the sensor can actually sense the dis uh, disabled people to uh, have a long extent of the crossing time. Uh, basically, it can be a self-awareness of the, this kind of sensors together. Uh, smart node is the, actually the integrated solutions on the things. Energy environment and the marketing, uh, uh, also the, using the beacon of small businesses. Uh, also, the context of evacuation guidance systems are all in the, uh, using the IoT applications in here as well. Uh, we are using the LPWA in test nationally, big data analysis, and also the IPv6, and also obviously very importantly, the IP, IoT security will be the critically important in our project as well and on the way. Uh, obviously, we wanted to expand, uh, scale up the, our testbed ecosystems to having a, a right for uh, private and public partnerships. And we try to open as possible to work with the other cities to creating the IoT industry together. Uh, in, in context of the smart city as well. Uh, that's the, what, what we're trying to do as a global expansion. And already the, we are through the EU program that Horizon 2020 or Eureka that we're actually doing the co-working with the, one of the Spain, uh, Spanish city in, in, in right now as well. Uh, we wanted to increase the more services for next year and uh, another year than that. But importantly, the citizen engagement will be the very important here to creating the new kind of uh, founding the companies and uh, finding the com uh, together uh, to uh, co-create and also coexist uh, and growing the actually ecosystems as well. Smart city cluster is the what we are trying to aim for. Uh, we wanted to actually expand into the different city and work together. Uh, obviously, we want to have a uh, interoperability with the other platform, with the other city. Uh, make sure that we can actually scale up together. Uh, obviously, there is going to be a cooperative program will be going along. I'm very happy to talk to with Dublin about these things after uh, our, our our session as well. Obviously, there will be a lot of a startup fair and also the hackathon or all this kind of program will be actually complement together uh, to create the IoT kind of sectors in, in Korea as well. Uh, so that's my conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for your nice presentation about what you are doing in Korea. It's very, very interesting. Let's continue with the presentation of Dante Ricci that is Senior Director of CAP. Dante has 20 years uh, experience in government te technology and is going to give us the, the view of uh, SAP in, in this area. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Excellent presentations by Dublin and Jong. The, <clears throat> the fact is we are just scratching the surface. You can see with both Korea and Dublin, there, there is a lot going on and a lot to do, and specifically with interconnectivity. Who in the audience has worked on an IoT projects or, or if are familiar from a program management standpoint has worked on it today? Oh, excellent. That's great. So I think you'll get a sense for what we're doing, different aspects and different maturities. And I, I agree, we're up at the, whoops, we're up at the height, and we're, we're, gonna, we're moving into understanding exactly what can be done. And our perspective at SAP, we, we're looking at not only the traditional Internet of Things and connecting sensors back and getting information and insights from data, but really connecting people, processes, and objects or physical things. And getting the contextual awareness that you need to not only make better decisions, but open that up for citizens to make decisions or mash up and, and utilize for better commutes, for safer communities. So what we're doing, uh, we're doing the, really the, the use cases are endless. We, we work with several different projects. Just to give you an, uh, an idea of the art of the possible, with the city of Nanjing, we're utilizing GPS signals to try to incorporate information, real-time information from traffic flow with accident and construction information to in increase and, and improve traffic flow and make it more efficient. In Montreal, we've piloted with the uh, Montreal Transit Agency 
looking at anonymizing passenger data, but f looking at the flows on the, the, the uh, bus and transit systems, metro systems, trains, and then also connecting that with commercial entities. So if the, the rider, the passenger wants to have their phone on, uh, they have their GPS signal, geospatial location, they can get, actually get offers from commercial entities to improve economic prosperity for those businesses in those areas when they're coming out of the train stations. Uh, we're looking at, we're working with Philips in the, in the city of Buenos Aires where we're looking at the LED lamps. We're working with the LED lamps to see which ones are going to fail faster so we can understand uh, and change those out quicker and create a safer environment. We're looking at working with Intel. Uh, matter of fact, uh, speaking of, I, I love the video from Dublin, but we're working with Intel and rolling out uh, some interconnectivity there. But it really is about the ecosystem and the art of the possible and what you can do with the data that comes from those people, the processes and those objects. And all of us have great ideas and it, it's great to see us uh, getting involved. One of the things we need to do though is the enable the infrastructure obviously from the hardware vendors down through to the software vendors from an analytical space and understanding and visualize that information that you're getting. So let me just give you one example and I'll play a video for you. This is the city of Buenos Aires. City of Buenos Aires has nine rivers, I believe, running underneath the city. Uh, they're, they're located on a large river <clears throat> and water, a body of water. In the past, in the city itself, they've lost many lives and had a lot of property damage. So in the past, uh, what they did was, uh, it was more of a manual effort where inspectors would go out into the field and understand what's going on with these water tunnels that they've provided and, and built under the city to, to remove the, uh, during the rainy season the water. But really what they needed was a combination of sensors in those water tunnels, but also the human input on those inspections with mobile devices to get true contextual awareness of what's going on so they can remove the issues and alleviate the funding. So let me just play this for you real quick. Oops. Fue como una ola, como un tsunami, y empezaron todos los muebles a, a flotar. 2013, relentless rain in Buenos Aires. Flash flooding in parts of the capital. Chaos in a city of 3 million and over 13 million in the area. Thousands of houses are flooded, like the Zelada's home. Se inundó todo. El auto, los equipos de música, papeles importantes. Todo lo que puedas imaginar se llenó de agua. But that was considered lucky. Almost 100 people died in the region during the 2013 deluge. Located at the mouth of Rio de la Plata, flooding has historically been an issue in Buenos Aires. Nine underground rivers run beneath the city, an aging infrastructure, drainage channels clogged with garbage, and a dense population don't help. A partir del trabajo de modernización de la ciudad, empezamos a tomar conciencia de que había información que podíamos utilizar para tomar decisiones más eficientes. Al principio, toda la administración estaba en papel. Nosotros nos dimos cuenta que de esa manera no era posible tomar las decisiones adecuadas. Technology to the rescue. The city turned to SAP for help. They collect and analyze data from sensors, weather reports, garbage collectors, and citizens' complaints in real time. The program, Future Cities, helps urban leaders improve people's quality of life. The sensors are all across town. They measure the direction, speed, and level of water. SAP HANA in-memory technology immediately identifies areas in need of support. It's very important to dispose of information in time real in situations of emergency to take immediate measures immediately. A delay of minutes can generate catastrophes eh, unpredictable. 
In 2014, it rained more than ever before in the history of Buenos Aires. But this time, the rain didn't rule. The city, flood free. 30,000 storm drains, clear. Neighboring areas not using the technology, still soaked. No estamos exentos de que lo que sucedió climáticamente en 2013 nos vuelva a suceder, así que para nosotros es muy importante lo que hicimos, ya que la tecnología nos permite adelantarnos a estas situaciones. For the Zeladas, this means more than clean streets and clean drains. It's safety and security for Claudia and her family. Technology has improved her life and millions of other lives in Buenos Aires, and it helped save the city money. A simple solution to a serious problem. So there, there's all kinds of projects that we're doing with Internet of Technology, and it is, we are just one player within a whole ecosystem of players, and we need to continue to work on open standards and interconnectivity. But we have to keep in mind it's about the community, it's in, about improving all of our lives, and if we keep that focus and we get the right information from the data, I think we'll all be better off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dante, for your nice presentation and how, to show us how Internet of Things can help in this kind of emergencies and, and solving this, the citizenship prob daily problem. Thank you. Now it's time for Larissa Romualdo Suzuki. She is currently the uh, data strategist of the Greater London Act Authority. She was completed a PhD in, in UCL University and a program at Imperial College Business School, and also she was working previously with IBM and AIUP. Larissa. Can I use this? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I have just completed my PhD on uh, helping cities to design their data strategy. Um, the first thing I want to uh, show you is this. This is the cost of inefficiency in cities' infrastructure. So this is the cost of energy waste, food waste, congestion, air pollution. This is the amount of money we waste, watering food we are going to throw away. And this little G down here is the Google annual profit. So if we compare the amount of money Google makes with the amount of money we waste, we have re a real challenge. And the main problem of that is caused by the fragmented supply chain of data we have in cities. So we have proprietary data providers, they hold their data, they don't want to share the data. We have a public data provider, they provide the way they want. We have volunteer citizens data with a lot of problems with privacy and other concerns. So we needed to coordinate uh, the supply chain of data from crowdsourced initiatives. That is a data that is dispersed, it's sensitive, IoT solutions that we have private data, real time, rich metadata and heterogeneous different formats and semantics, and also government data, which we have a lot of initiatives on open data, but we don't have an, an agreement on standard. So it's very difficult sometimes to consume, to reuse the data, and to get machines to process the data for us. Because we are humans, we are very expensive. We have to leave machines to do uh, things for us. But at the moment, it's very difficult to have machines to process that the data that we have out there. The main problem is because uh, we have a closed platform approach adopted today, which is uh, IoT cities, they are trying to provide a holistic solution. And the problem is city data is not exploited to its full potential because we cannot get private data providers to give us data. And we provide the data that we have, but we don't have the capabilities maybe to provide an extra functionalities that will enable users to consume the data, to clean the data, to integrate data. So uh, the main idea behind my research is about creating platform ecosystem that is platform to platform integration in the IoT. So we can deliver the full value of cross-domain city data, which is the competition model. We collaborate, but we also compete. And just so you know, this companies from 1984 until 2004, they experienced 500% increase in innovation by transforming their products 
into platforms, by joining their products into wider platforms. And I think we should do this for city data so we can exploit the food potential of that. So we understand what we are talking about. This is just for us to have a definition of the terms we use. So a platform can be understood as a foundation technology or sets of components used beyond a single firm that brings together multiple parties for a common purpose or recurring problem. So we have a lot of people providing services into a platform. The ecosystem of platform is when we share mechanisms, sorry, uh, for economic mechanisms, technical, legal, and organizational, to bring platforms together so that everyone can collect data, provide data in their own platform, but also share it with partners, and then they can get citizens to volunteer with data, and then they can share data in different channels. They can commercialize data, they can create a marketplace for data in smart cities. So for this, we don't have any blueprint for that yet, and this is what I, I try to bring in my PhD, that is the Smartify framework, that is a dynamic business models framework which helps us to gather the requirements from many domains in the city data strategy. So we can put them together and help platforms to be integrated with the other platforms. So this is dynamic because requirements in platforms, they evolve over time. So in the research and development phase, we have uh, five domains, that is the service, the technology, the governance, organizational, and finance. And then we have the external forces affecting the platform, that is market change, uh, technology change, new regulations put in place, and also we have feedback from previous experience and other platforms available if we are starting a new platform. So, so you understand what is inside each of these components. In the service, we talk about the value proposition, the target groups, which are the users we want to consume our data. We have the service delivery infrastructure for the, we have the technology, the sensors, the database, the data model, how we're gonna model the data uh, to deliver to users. And we have our important value network in the organization domain. So we bring partners as a part of the data processing for us. And in finance, we have the economic models, business models for the exploitation of data. So we move along in the procurement phase, rollout and market. So this is a dynamic process that we feed all the time so we gather updated requirements that are useful, will help people to create platform-to-platform -platform integration. And uh, in my framework, I provide sets of templates for you to start modeling your own approach, gather your requirements, refine, create requirements straight off, because sometimes you want to model your data in some way that will compromise scalability. So you have to create those trade-offs. And now so it can help you to understand with how you can commercially exploit city data. Uh, because one thing we have to understand is city data, even if they are open, even if data is open, it's not free. It's expensive to produce open data. And private data, the providers of the data, they have to maintain sensors, they have to invest a lot. So we have to understand how we can fully exploit those business models so people can really fully exploit the city data. So what we get from this uh, business model is a set of requirements and uh, components and business models that we then refine with critical success factors that we define for our platform and critical design issues. So for me, critical design issues could be scalability, interoperability, critical success factors could be drive innovation, and then we can measure this to create a viable platform business strategy that can be integrated with other platforms, and now so viable requirements specifications. Why is that important? For our IoT middleware, we need self-adaptive, reflective, and closed-loop supply chain models in our IoT. Why? If I have a sensor, I can have different business models for that sensor. The sensor could act for, some, for a purpose, but then I can range that, I can sell data for another purpose for some, somebody else. So we can exploit uh, different contexts of use for sensors and for data, and we can use requirements as runtime artifacts to update our, our architecture. So for instance, if I have a sensor that is producing data in a particular context, and at a certain time, that sensor will be going to be used for a different purpose. We can change at runtime 
we can change the business models, the policy attached to that data, the security and the quality of services mechanism of the platform while the platform is still running. Um, so we can move from this forward logistic carbon data that we have today. We produce data, we store, we deliver, and then we dispose. We can move it to a more integrated platform in which we have a closed loop supply chain model in which we reuse data in such a way that we can drive innovation, create new applications and new business models, and businesses, they will be more inclined to open data for us. I don't have time to show a demo, but I'm just gonna show you a little experiment I did. So this is an architecture that I derived from my business model framework. By the way, I have two frameworks in my thesis. I'm just showing the business models because because of the time constraint. So I have another framework that is a supply chain framework for us to get the requirements convert into components, software components, and create an architecture. So I have this architecture from that to exploit different business models in which we have data coming from sensors, going to our platform, and being delivered to surveillance, to the grid, so to, to, to city hall, to data scientists, different entities. So the logistical distribution of city data is different. So we have data that should be within the sector, data that should be always free, data that cannot be sold, data that can be sold. So we have different uh, ways of exploring uh, city data. Finally, the main idea is to create an ecosystem of platforms that we can share data, commercialize, fully exploit, and create uh, interoperability in between data. Because what happens today is, I am a computer scientist. Um, if you create an application to run in London using the London Data Store data, that will work, okay, you have to do a lot of cleanup, yeah, manually. But then you go to Paris, you want to do the same application. You have to build an entire new application from the beginning. So it's too much time consuming, and we are so expensive, we shouldn't be doing it. So the idea is we have an ecosystem of platforms with shared you know, infrastructure, with shared sensors, shared data, shared uh, semantics, and shared uh, standards that we can drive uh, jobs and competitiveness. We have some open challenges that is still creating licenses for data for the commercial exploitation of data, standards for the semantic, and incentives for the release of commercial data. And that's it. And I'm going to be in another session this afternoon talking about urban platforms. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about those things. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Larissa. Excellent data analysis. Congratulations. And we close the presentation round with Marco Rodriguez. He's senior service manager of Thyssen Group Elevator, one of the leading elevator companies in the world. And before uh, working in smart cities, he, he has previous experience in various other technology-oriented industries, such as biotechnology and aerospace. Good afternoon, and welcome to Max. Hello. When we talk when we talk about cities, as we've been doing in this congress over the past days, we almost always forget a very important element of cities, which is the elevator. Actually, there are lots of elevators in the cities around the world. There are more than 12 million units installed and growing every day, as the cities grow as well. And most of you are most probably part of the 20% of the world population. This is more than one billion people that take an elevator every day. And all those people perform more than seven billion elevator trips, day in, day out. From these figures, you can see that elevators are an integral part of our cities and of our daily lives. And smart cities require smart elevators. Because at the end of the day, we all know that the aim of making cities smarter is to improve the quality of life of those millions of people living there. And elevators are key to achieving this. Take a moment and think yourself of your own experience. When we take an elevator, we usually take for granted that everything works fine without failure. And usually we only realize how safe and reliable they are when one day something doesn't work as expected. 
Have a look at this lady above me. She's obviously not enjoying her elevator trip. And those of you who have got stuck in an elevator, you know that it's not a nice experience. Now imagine that with the help of Max, we could have avoided this situation from happening. Think of her quality of life, how this would have influenced her quality of life. As you see, when we talk about quality of life, it's not about the cities, the global population, it's about the individual experiences we all do also when we take an elevator. And despite the highest safety standards in our industry, elevators are very safe means of transportation, actually the safest. And also despite the huge efforts industry players do to prevent failures from happening, elevators are complex systems and they're getting more and more complex and failures will occur. However, there's still room of improvement in our industry in regards to raising availability levels, uptime, and shifting the mindset in elevator service from reactive to proactive. And this is where Max comes into play, and this is why we claim that Max is a true game changer for our industry. Because Max goes beyond a simple remote monitoring system. With Max, we will be able to identify trends and patterns in the elevator data and predict and prevent the failures and breakdowns before they even occur. We call this predictive maintenance. The system consists of three main elements. The first one is the Max device, the hardware, that we install on our elevators where it collects the data, extracts it, and sends it to the second element, the Microsoft Cloud. The Microsoft Cloud is the core, is the brain of the system. Because here we not only store the relevant elevator data, but we also merge it with data coming from our local systems. And we apply smart algorithms developed with Microsoft and machine learning so that we can predict failures and offer smart troubleshooting support to our technicians in the unlikely event that the failure finally happens. The third element is the human interface. Dashboards and mobile solutions allow key users of the system, like our technicians, to interact with the system, to extract the relevant knowledge, and to realize the system benefits. Because Max will benefit all of us as elevator users in the long term, for example, by improving, increasing the safety of the elevators. Because by reducing the number of failures, we are also reducing the overall exposure to risk Max will maximize availability, uptime, and our target is to have our, in our units 50% downtime less over the long run. And since we will have a much more in-depth knowledge of our units, of the real health status of the units, we'll be able to improve the system reliability and to offer an even better service quality to our technicians. And as with any technical system, if you perform an optimal maintenance, as we will do with Max, you can extend the life cycle, the useful life of the system. And finally, by avoiding failures from happening, we also avoid having to send technicians to the faulty elevator, which usually they do by car, thereby reducing CO2 emissions. And all those benefits can only be realized by digitalizing our elevators, by applying the internet of things to the elevator industry. And ThyssenKrupp and Microsoft are committed with this project, with Max, to digitalize the elevator industry. We'll be rolling out Max over the next 18 months, initially in North America and Europe, and we expect to have 80% of our units under maintenance in the long term equipped with Max so that we can offer those benefits to our customers. Let's, let me show you how all this fits in the, with the vision of Max with this short video. Take a look at the world we live in today. So much more exciting than ever before. Offering limitless possibilities. Take a look at all the powerful tools in the hands of nearly everyone. Technology has become an essential part of our everyday lives, providing personal guidance, 
and valuable information. Take a look at the cities of today, rapidly growing, redefining our urban landscapes, creating the best place to live ever. More than one billion people worldwide ride on elevators every day. Therefore, absolute reliability is crucial. Any technical device constantly produces information, signals about its condition. From now on, we can turn every elevator into a communicating device, using the signals they provide to calculate the remaining lifetime of key systems and components in real time, maximizing availability and safety. This huge amount of data from millions of connected sensors is constantly gathered and analyzed and instantly providing information about required actions to service technicians, enabling predictive and even preemptive maintenance to keep cities moving, saving time for people and empowering technicians to prevent breakdowns before they occur. It's much more than simple remote monitoring. It is taking the elevator industry into the digital era, making the elevator tell us what it needs. A tremendous increase of service quality for buildings and people. That's what Max is all about. Maximum uptime all of the time. Max, a true revolution in elevator service. Max, Tyson Krupp, predictive maintenance. This is our vision for Max. This is the Internet of Things applied to the elevator industry. And the next time you take an elevator from Dusen Group, remember that this vision has already become a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. Clearly, Internet of Things can contribute to the security of the citizens. Now we have time for discussion and questions from the audience. So if there are any questions, I ask you to formulate in a brief manner and, and also say name and company when formulating the, the question. Any question, any comment? So I will start with a, a question for to, to Marco. Uh, we have a, a microphone in, this, in the room, but in, in the meantime, I will make the question to Marco. It's, uh, now we have a change in the paradigm of maintain the maintenance of the uh, sensor in, and Internet of Things, the sensor. So from reactive to proactive. This is a real change in, and a uh, real improvement in the management of, of the sensor. How do you um, evaluate this change? Uh, absolutely. Um, the elevator industry is currently working as like 20 years ago. When there's a failure, when there's a breakdown, we react to it. Now with this kind of system, with the Internet of Things, and especially the predictive part, that we can predict failures, the whole business model changes for good because the customers will not see even, and not uh, have the trouble of seeing these failures because we will avoid them before they occur. And now the question from the audience. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, I have a question more related with the security. I don't know uh, some of the speakers. Do you have previous experience in security in uh, IoT platforms like software-defined networking? How we handle the security? I don't know if. Uh, hi, hi. In terms of security, I think the I think that will be the, our main challenge at the moment. Uh, we try to deploy to the a lot of services to the public citizens, and uh, for example, like uh, kindergarten schools that uh, we wanted to uh, uh, give them a like a hand band for the just make sure that there is no lost chart. Uh, on the on the you know on our back to school and the parents can track the actually the the information there. Uh, those kind of things have to be uh, 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 security you know they have to be done. Uh, technically, you can do it uh, in terms of the security, 
uh, and uh, among, among the, our urban platform, we are developing the IoT platform. We are developing. Obviously, the IoT security module is uh, critically important, but um, the, the important thing is the, actually the perceptions of the things. That if the things happen in the news, then the par parents become a little bit suspicious about the services, and that is very make it really very hard as well. So, the city have to be really you know looking into this uh, aspect into the more. Uh, how we can actually promote the services and into the more safe way, and basically the PR for the you know this service is becoming very uh, critically important. So I would say the technological development is also important, but also other kind of uh, efforts have to be done uh, quickly to you know make sure the diffusions of the services uh, widespread. Yeah, understood. Okay, thank you very much. Hi there, this is, uh, my name is Sin Wei, I come from Singapore, and I'm from the National Water Agency, so uh, it's great to hear examples of flood management and flood monitoring from, you know, the various speakers. I, I mean, I just want to ask a question about what do you guys see, see as the next generation of IoT, you know, for flood monitoring? Yeah, and, uh, you know, I think we've seen some examples of what is being done in Dublin and also in Bruno Arias, and so what? What could be the next possibility, you know, as we, you know, have more of this digitization and sensors, you know, and so what, what, what could we do? And yeah, and Marco, please feel free to chip in as well. Like, yeah, have it here, your thoughts. I think it's, it's really about, you know, hyper-local and being able to deploy, you know, dense network of sensors, but at really low cost. Um, and I think, you know, part of our experiment in Dublin is how can you validate these low cost sensors against the more expensive ones? And how can you ensure that they give you the right type of data? Uh, because you don't want to be panicking your citizens in real time that there's something happening that's not. <laughs> so I suppose just working with the different uh, providers to figure out you know, what's the best sensor quality that you can get at the lowest cost. And that's always a challenge. And you know, that's across all different sectors. I mean, flood monitoring is, is, is a bit easier to look at in terms of the low-cost sensors, but areas like air quality, I mean, big challenge across cities. I mean, low-cost air quality monitoring sensors are difficult to, um, to come by, and there's a lot of experimentation in that space. But I, I think for us, it's the granularity of the, the sensing and uh, how you can just get that better picture uh, in real time in hyper-local context. I think the next step is incorporating the information and data to get knowledge about how you can plan better in the future and also be agile enough to change policy within government. So if you can take that information and bring it to the legislature or even uh, <clears throat> anonymize it to the point where you can cross departments and get a horizontal view of the information with other information instead of just that one particular scenario, I think that's the next step. In terms of the elevator industry, the next logical step is not only connect our, all of our units and the maintenance with this uh, uh, system, but also connect to the other Internet of Things that we have in the city, for example, with the building that we can really manage within a city the whole flow of people f into the buildings, outside the buildings, and within the city. Um, what I also think is uh, the exploration of new use cases. Uh, with cross-domain data, city data, we are able to exploit more things. Uh, for instance, I've worked in projects that we put sensors in the sewage system to see how diseases would spread across the city. Uh, and also working with drones, instead of sending people to go and check the quality of water, you could send drones to really make an image, a mapping image of uh, the water to track the condition of water. And also in medical science, like tracking people uh, who suffer from epilepsy to understand. So I think it's the application of use cases that we use cross the main city data. And that's why it's very important that we try to push, uh, you know, governments and open data stores to try to become platform to platform integrated. I just in terms of the next generation of IoT, I think the uh, it, it will be the data driven. Every decision making have to be data driven, and the policy making going to be like that. But 
think from the private sector perspective, I think the LG U+, uh, which is the telecommunication company, already start uh, IoT smart home services in Korea right now under the $10 that they can subscribe things. And uh, you know, the thing is, some of the technology is uh, you know, already there, but uh, through the IoT, it become a more cost effective sometimes as well. So uh, in terms of the uh, managing this cost will be the also very important aspects when you actually operate in the city as well. Yeah. Yes, thanks very much for the responses. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Yeah, I do. Um, in light of the recent events in Paris, how are cities, you know, going to leverage um, data from building information management systems and, uh, you know, sensors within buildings to provide some good, actionable intelligence to first responders so that they can respond quickly? That's a great, great question. There's, there's a couple things going on. It's, it's really around uh, getting complete situational awareness or common operating picture, not in a particular, not only in a particular building, but uh, across the, the uh, particular forces or emergency responders. And you have to have uh, a combination of uh, a contextual awareness by the emergency responders to be able to input data into that common operating picture, to be able to get a real-time understanding back at the operations center as to what's going on and then being able to have that personalized for those first responders, uh, whether it's police, um, uh, SWAT team, or even military. The second thing is you need to understand from that common operating picture uh, as to where the equipment and where the supplies are. Sounds boring, <laughs> but if you have multiple instances around a particular city at the same time, you're not gonna be able to scale your response unless you know exactly where everything is and have that bi-directional feed with those responders. So that's a, it's something that uh, <clears throat> in the past was very siloed in nature, I, would, I believe. Well, we've done some experiments, I'm sure several have, with understanding uh, where not only the current responders are, but also responders that are not online. So you have multiple jurisdictions, but you can also call up and uh, alert those that are also within a geospatial location. Uh, so there's there's several different ways of doing that, but I don't know if it's, nobody solved the true answer, but I think that's where they're going to get that horizontal picture for a personalized response. Any other question? Okay, if there are no other questions, we are ending the, the panel where we have learned uh, the new vision and the future of Internet of Things. We have talked about efficiency, about uh, cost reduction, about integration, about uh, the new ways of managing the, the, the big amount of new data, and the, from reactive man maintenance to proactive maintenance. So uh, we have reviewed the, 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 the different aspects of the, the future of Internet of Things and also how that can help from technology to the, to the citizenship. That is really important. So I want to finish thanking the, the panelists of, of, for their presentation. Thank you very much. See you next year. Thank you.